Welcome to This Is AI, a podcast brought to you by West Monroe. We're going to show you, step by step, how to build, use, and master AI to create the most value for your business. Well, welcome back to the podcast, folks. Uh, if you have not watched the first two episodes, welcome to the podcast. And you should go watch those first two. Uh, we talk a little bit about what the podcast is about, what we're going to cover, and uh, tell you a little bit about our, ourselves more in depth. We'll, we'll do a quick recap for you uh, here. If you don't know who West Monroe is, we are a consultancy that focuses on you know, the, the intersection, I think, of, you know, amazing digital experiences and deep industry expertise, you know, anywhere from financial services through healthcare and many others. Uh, we not only bring, you know, I think thought leadership and strategy to our client partnerships, but also the ability to build and create together um, and, and get uh, amazing experiences out in the market. Um, this podcast- You think gonna... we do those things, but you're not sure? I. I know we do those things. Oh, okay. I Brownie. just wanted to confirm. I love the pitch other than I'm that. very sure. I'm sold. Um, kind of? Fantastic. I think I'm sold? I think you are. Yeah, I'm sold. All right, All right. let's move on. Awesome. <laughs> this podcast, <laughs> we're talking about AI, um, and uh, and it's going to be fun. Uh, you know, we covered a little bit about what you should uh, think about from an AI uh, overview perspective in the last couple of podcasts. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a specific use case. We're going to talk a little bit about prompt engineering and prompting in, in uh, LLMs to set it up, and then we'll, we're going to do a little bit of show and tell. Don't worry for those of you who are just listening. We'll, we'll narrate what we're showing on the screen as we get into it um, so uh, you don't feel left behind. But if you want, feel free to check out the video content as well. Um, my name's EJ. I'm a director in our product experience and engineering practice at, uh, at West Monroe. Um, my passion is emerging technology and, and building digital products. So I'm, I'm amped to talk about this stuff. Who are you two? I am Eric Brown, aka Brownie. I'm a humanoid powered by a combination of Skynet Genesis from Cyberdyne Systems and Gen 2 Linux. And I'm going to take over the world. Uh, the, the first, I mean, I, I think I started with Red Hat, but I did get into Gen 2, and uh, I think the only thing I ever did with that was install it over and over and over again. Uh, I yeah, don't compi- think I actually I, used it. <laughs> in order to merge it with uh, Skynet, I had to compile everything from scratch and kind of get the hooks right. Fair enough. That's what's um, fun with Gen 2. I think we've gone to, we've lost... We we've lost all of our viewers now. I Listeners, think so. Whatever. Quick, we have quickly, two left, and they're quickly, like hardcore Ryan, nerds. Save yeah. us. Yeah, and is is my mic working? I, I hope. Huh? Yes. I'm, I but, mean, I can hear you. <laughs> thank you. So Ryan Elmore, Innovation Fellow, Head of Data Science, um, and I don't know what to do with my hands. What, That's fair. Neither does AI. AI oddly enough, enough, pick up a razor and some shaving cream. <laughs> yeah, next week. Next week, I will. <laughs> right on. Uh, well, let's maybe let's get into it here. Um, so, like I said, today we're going to talk about something we built, a proof of concept in in the healthcare space, uh, leveraging generative AI. But in order to get started, uh, I think it'd be helpful for you all to um, understand, uh, if you're not already fluent in it, sort of how prompts work uh, when you're interacting with a large language model. I think the world is pretty familiar with one of the common interaction uh, paradigms for generative AI, and that's chat. Uh, chat GPT in particular from OpenAI is a pretty common one. We know there's others out there like Claude from Anthropic or Bard from uh, Google. Uh, Bing is now leveraging OpenAI's infrastructure as well for their experiences. But chat is a pretty common interaction paradigm for large language models. And that means that you have to know how to interact with it. You certainly can just dive into a conversation, but you can get some really great results if you actually start crafting what are called prompts, things, uh, strings of text that get the uh, large language model to solicit the right response that you're looking for. That could include giving it a persona, giving it a personality, giving it some structure or criteria for how you want it to respond to your input and, and how you want that output that it gives you to be formatted. So I think, Ryan, let's maybe uh, dive into a couple of brief examples, uh, just to ground. We won't spend a lot of time on this, folks, uh, just to ground our listeners on on what we're talking about here. And and for those of you uh, listening in, we're going to be using um, ChatGPT for these first couple of prompts here. Um, we'll do our best to uh, to narrate for you as we go. But but Ryan, why don't you uh, why don't you dive in with the demo here? 
Yeah, definitely. And as you see on the screen and for the listeners, it is GPT-4. Uh, we are behind the firewall here with the plus version. Uh, so it is the latest one. So I wanted to kick off with kind of a short story on how I got to this prompt here. Uh, my mom was actually visiting us here in Texas about uh, three weeks ago now for a birthday party from Virginia. And I was explaining to her what I do, what I've been doing these last six months, these road shows, talking about generative AI. And as her eyes started glazing over of, of understanding what it was, I tried to use short words and very concise of how I was explaining it. I said, you know what, why don't I just show you what this is? So she was saying that she couldn't go to her book club because uh, she was going to see these hot air balloons out in Utah. I said, well, why don't I write that email for you? Uh, so it says, create a short email to my book club telling them that I'm not able to make it this month due to being at the balloon festival in Utah. And I added this, tie in a quirky pun of hot air balloons in the closing. So we send that in. It thinks for a second, subject, up, up, and away, this book month's book club. Hello, lovely bookworms. I hope this message finds you well in and deep into the adventures of a current read. I'm writing you to touch of disappointment and whims whimsy as I need to let you know that I will be missing our delightful gathering this month as I head not my head will not be buried in books, but rather tilting upwards, gazing at the sea of vibrant hot air balloons. Um, I specifically asked it to be short email, but it apparently right thought four paragraphs was right. Yeah, short seems a little <laughs> bit subjective. Uh, I think yeah. when you're writing prompts. Um, but I'll fast forward to the end of it here. It says, please forgive me for not being carried away this time. But remember, even when I'm full of hot air, you'll still be keeping me grounded. Oof. Oh, oh nice. Thank you. Chad nice. GPT. So I'm she actually sent a version of that. You're, I'm just, I can't get over the fact your mom's actually asking about generative AI. Because when yeah. I visit my parents, my, my dad needs about 30 minutes of help with his MSN.com email account. Mm -hmm. and the experience. client that fell out of support in the late 90s. Yeah, yeah I, I, I would say I probably live in between the two of you. Um, you know, I do a little bit of tech support uh, when I chat with my dad, and then um, he does have some questions about, like, ethical concerns of generative AI and then how it can be used by positive and bad actors out in the world. So it's, it's a good range of human experience there, I think, yes. that we just covered. Yep, exactly. So I, I then went to this quick... Um, you go full screen, um, which was create a short story about a turtle, which is make up her name, who overcomes adversity and succeeds at a difficult task. And this so again, so I, again, Ryan, this is a prompt that you plugged into GPT-4. It just correct, says an example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That first one was was the was the uh, prompt that I put in, and here's the story that it came up with. Um, I then said, well, why don't we rewrite this as a first grade level? Uh, my son at the time was in first grade, so he was able to understand it and be able to tell the story. Um, and again, these are just simple prompts, kind of where everybody kind of gets started. But this so is you're where starting I wanted with, to show her. Yeah, so you're starting with that prompt of like craft the story. It gives you several paragraphs. You're then saying, all right, that's great. But then rewrite it at a first grade level. It simplifies it to maybe more of a two or three sentence snippet that could, you know, hop on a potentially a page of illustrations, Ryan. Yeah, that's a, that's a great segue. Um, so I actually did that exact aspect where I said, well, why don't I create a short story for my son to actually look at some pictures? I took each of the sentences, copy pasted it into uh, image gen, and it came up with an illustration for this uh, short story. So we're looking uh, at a, a short story oh. about tiny Tina, the turtle here with some, uh, some uh, pretty, pretty good illustrations of turtles underwater and, uh, and that first grade, um, uh, reading level uh, of the story. Exactly. And I asked it to create realistic imagery, uh, be high res, high detail. Uh, and then I just copy pasted the, the individual sentences in. Uh, second one, Tina was a bit smaller than the others. Uh, so it shows uh, five turtles on the screen. Uh, one of them is obviously smaller than the rest. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the final one, which is the, the colossal underwater formation of which Tina has to overcome. As a just a beautiful imagery, I, I was really impressed with it of a yeah, underwater this is, mountain. Yeah, that's actually pretty cool. The mountain of the depths, uh, I think, is yep. awesome. Like that's a really really cool illustration. It, it kind of looks for for the listeners. It kind of looks like a a uh, an underwater iceberg uh, yeah. surrounded with coral or or seaweed or something. It, it's pretty awesome looking. Um, did you did you uh, run this by your kid, Ryan? I did. Yeah, I showed it to him. I read him the entire story. He loved it. 
That's um, awesome. He's a big, big fan. Um, so one more example. This is one of our uh, history of generative AI. It's our internal um, deck that we go through when, I, when we talk about Gen AI. Each one of these images in, in a similar fashion um, is uh, generated with Gen AI, copy pasted okay. what's below, and even the, the people's faces are, are generated through uh, stable diffusion. And, and this is the, uh, the, for the, for the listeners, a timeline that we use that kind of says the history of generative AI. It was not end of last year when it started hitting the news cycle. It was actually, you know, back in the fifties and, you know, likely earlier, and then charts through all these iterations of people describing the possibility, building foundational understanding, the data behind it, the models, and, and now we arrive at the present. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and real quick, I, please. when we think of prompt engineering, we hear that term a lot, right? And this is kind of an example of part of that build from a basic prompt. I mean, I, when people start with this thing, they're asking just basic questions, right? Or kind of one shot, one, one question, looking for response, see how, seeing how valid, how, how deep it is, et cetera. But you get into the engineering when you start interacting it with the AI in a more verbose, directive way, right? Like in this case, Ryan, you started saying, all right, give me something else at the level of a first grader. You can get even deeper than that. Pretend you are acting as this type of persona. Mm -hmm. You are only going to speak about these types of things, these topics, et cetera. And you can get a little bit more elaborate in the way you engineer the interactions, not only for the proper response, but the tone of the response, the color of the response, and that sort of thing. That's a great call yeah. out, Ronnie. Yeah, definitely. And then continuing on the, the story with my mom still showing her what what the basics of this is. Um, this was an article I posted on LinkedIn. Uh, it's one about Ronnie's best friends, um, where I created the Terminator walking through a snowy meadow on fire, uh, just to support um, some of the misconceptions of where AI is today, based on Hollywood and the movies we see. So That's that image, awesome. again, totally generated with uh, uh, this was stable diffusion as well. Yeah. And if you're interested in that article, we'll make sure it's in the in the show notes so you can check it out. Yep. Um, yeah. So get, getting back to the prompting, we've shown a couple of, of really simple ones, create, write an email, uh, do some imagery. But what if we kind of start getting a little bit more complex? Um, this is one of our examples that we've created to showcase some of the, the breadth of where it can uh, give it a lot more instructions. So this one is around a production planner. Uh, so you are my production planner. I want you to listen to what I'm about to say, and I'm going to ask some follow-up questions. Tell me you understand the information I'm providing with, say, what questions would you like? We go and this in and is... give it... Ryan, this is just for clarity. This is a uh, an example that kind of lives in the consumer and industrial product space. Maybe a, I'm, I'm at a factory or a production facility or something like that. Exactly right. Exactly right. So you see, we have multiple companies. We start feeding it with information. Company A has production lines. There's three of them. Here's what how much it can produce. Here's the SKUs that it can produce. Here's the assumptions. Line one can only make SKUs one through five. Uh, line three can only make SKUs three, four, and five. We have three shifts, seven days a week. Here's the shift times between uh, eight hours. There's skew changeovers between the lines if we wanted to create something different. Um, all of the skews take different amounts of time to clean up, add the different product. Um, here's other constraints. Only trained people can work specific lines. Sen seniority determines. You see, we're just adding on additional uh, parameters to make it act and, and handle the way that we want to. So. Again, there's a lot of information. I think this is about a three-page Word document when you, uh, when you print it out. We then talk about each of the individual employees. For example, employee three, train to work lines one, two, and three. No preference in the line. They can work any day of the week. So putting in constraints there. Um, here's employee four, the, the schedule. They can do multiple shifts per day. Uh, they're trying to save up for Christmas uh, coming up. So uh, again, we have 50 employees here, I believe. Yeah, uh, 30, 30, 40 different employees. And then here's the demand of what's needed between April 2nd and the 9th. Uh, we have SKU 1 can do 1,500 units um, and so on down to SKU 5, 2,000 units. So we send that over and as expected, yeah, so we, we end up with the, all of those aspects of this, of this prompt. We hit send um, and scroll down to see the answer. 
And as expected, what questions can I help you answer? Yeah, so now so, it, it understands what I asked and is ready for additional prompts. That's awesome. So, so essentially, uh, while you're before you get into asking a question, um, you've uh, you've told it what it's going to do, how it's going to perform. You've given it data that let's imagine a world where you're not pasting that data in. You're actually pulling that data from a connected system, mm -hmm. like a you know a, a factory floor management solution or an HR system, or whatever for the employee data and information. Um, and then you also entered in some of the forecasting you want to do. Um, so this you could imagine a space where you're not having to paste this stuff in. You're actually connecting these to data systems. Spoiler alert: We're going to talk about that next. But let's uh, let's ask a question now that you've primed the the AI. Exactly. So we're going to ask it create a production schedule for April third through seventh. Um, gives some information, some warnings, and it goes ahead and starts telling us exactly how we go about it. Um, here's the general approach that we would take. And it should, if we did this right, actually give us what the uh, production schedule should be. There it is. So I like that it gives you that kind of upfront assumptions that it's baking in there, right? Um, and you could actually provide those ahead of time as well. Like consider these assumptions when you're producing this schedule. I see that, you know, for our listeners, it's it's creating a, you know, shift two for lines one, two, and three, uh, listing the SKUs and the employees. Um, looks like it's uh, maybe using some variable placeholders here for eligible employee. Um, this would be a great connection point for an HR system uh, where you could actually drop in, you know, employee numbers or employee IDs. Um, and, and I think you could probably extend from here too, right? Like what's the impact if one of my 40 employees calls in sick or, you know, is on vacation? How does that impact this shift schedule that I've, I've created? Yep. Exactly. And I love the build here, right? Because we started with kind of the simple prompts. We got into some more interesting prompt engineering scenarios, but a lot of that rightfully so when you're starting to work with chat GPT was content generation, right? Mm -hmm. So now we're getting into how do we use data and more complex engineered prompts to actually drive a business function, right? Do something from a, from a business that actually generates business value, right? In the form of a production schedule, right? And yeah. Maybe automating something that's very manual now. And you can see how that being augmented by live data as it's changing could be even more valuable. So it's kind of a good build to the next example that we're going to be getting into. Yeah, that's a great call out, Bronnie. Maybe maybe let's uh, shift gears a little bit here from consumer and industrial projects, uh, products over to uh, healthcare. Um, and that's actually what we're going to be talking about for you know the balance of this, uh, this podcast is um, a a proof of concept that we built that is in the healthcare space um, and and just a quick setup on you know why we built it um, you know it's uh, it, there's a lot of complexity out in the healthcare space which if whether you're in healthcare or whether you use healthcare which hopefully you're either one or the other um, you know I think you know you know there's complex terminology there's inconsistent support depending on the systems or the companies that you engage with. If you're on chat or on calls, you can experience long wait times. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, processes native to healthcare. You know, one is the claims process that can be confusing uh, when you're trying to figure out what your insurance is going to cover based on a recommendation from your your provider or your your doctor. Um, and and there's just some uh, you know challenges with availability of of humans to solve your problem and and connecting communication across different channels. So there's a lot of opportunity for um, solution, I think, in the healthcare space. Um, one of the challenges, I think, historically, um, when we think about what, what those solutions look like today, there's a lot of chatbots that are out there. A lot of them are procedurally driven by, you know, business logic and, and maybe more traditional machine learning algorithms, but they're not very dynamic. They can be frustrating because if you don't know exactly how to use them or exactly what they can do, um, they have a hard time understanding what you need and, and how to remediate the solution and often are a barrier to getting to a human rather than an enabler to route you to the correct solution. Um, and when you're having those terrible experiences, that can feel very... Um, very disjointed when you're supposed to be working with a brand that you know cares about you in a, in a healthcare um, capacity. What we think about from the future 
and what we're going to show you today um, is something where generative AI can help bridge those gaps. It can help improve accuracy. It can help navigate a complex uh, set of systems behind the scenes, whether that's structured data with uh, insurance quotes or unstructured data with procedure information. Um, it can help you know, patients interact with their insurance providers and healthcare providers um, in a more sort of natural and convenient way. Um, and, and stay engaged in the process rather than getting frustrated and, and abandoning um, you know, the, the, their goal of setting up a, a primary care visit or uh, resolving a claim issue. Um, and then let's start picking away at those more complex tasks, you know, like uh, booking appointments or you know, reordering prescriptions with slight changes or you know, understanding what, you're going, what it's gonna cost for a potential procedure you're gonna have are um, complex things that happen in the healthcare space right now, and um, we can use, I think, generative AI to start walking down the path of making them more accessible for users out in the space. So we're gonna walk you through something that we call Coverage Oracle. It's a proof of concept West Monroe built, uh, leveraging some publicly available data, also some um, you know private data behind the scenes, uh, all demo in this environment, so we're not exposing any PII or, or PHI in any capacity. Uh, this is uh, for testing purposes only, but Similar to what we were talking through with the CNIP uh, scheduling uh, tool in ChatGPT, we've now taken this and uh, used generative AI to connect to multiple systems behind the scenes to provide a, a workflow or an experience. Brownie, you want to maybe walk us through uh, a demo of what this looks like? And, and for our listeners, we'll, we'll do the same thing we did with, with Ryan's stuff. We'll, we'll do a little bit of not live narration, but if you're watching on the video, we will show you uh, what we're walking through as we get going. Yeah, so EJ, you set it up really well. I mean, what we were trying to do here and talking with one of our large um, healthcare payer clients was see if we could use the power of human type human-like interaction with a large language model to automate a lot of the basic calls they get about coverage, right? That, it, that has real business value implications in terms of pulling unnecessary volume off the, date, off the call center, um, automating those interactions, and then maybe eventually, this isn't that dynamic yet, but eventually being able to forward uh, members on when they have a more complex need, like maybe pre-authorization for a certain procedure. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to show the interface here and kind of talk through it for those that aren't in front of video. And and while 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 Brownie's bringing that up, we uh, built this using some expected large language model technology out there, and also mm -hmm. some I think uh, more um, forward thinking uh, capabilities as well in the in the large language model space. So if you're interested in sort of the details behind the mechanics of how we built this, the tech architecture, you know, please reach out. We'd be happy to chat with folks about how we put experiences like this together. Absolutely. And I'll over, give an overview of that at a very high level, right? So it's kind Excellent. of a great example of the build. Ryan walked us through basic prompts, more complex prompts, and, and, and increasing the complexity of prompt engineering in general and using it in mul 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 multiple modalities, right? We were producing imagery to support a story that was generated. Uh, we alluded to this, but this is an example of now in a business scenario and an integrated scenario with multiple systems using a combination of prompt engineering where we're telling the LLM how to behave behind the scenes in addition to what's referred as RAG, RAG, so Retrieval Augmented Generation, we're integrating that LLM with calls to an API about coverage information and cost, right? So we're building using a framework called LangChain, which is a common framework used to kind of piece different LLMs together and combine that with parsing documents, looking at retrieving data from different data sources. So it's a great framework to kind of orchestrate an LLM or multiple LLMs with other sources of information. So, so that's kind of the setup to the technology behind this. Um, and the idea is we have a bot that can understand context and answer more complex questions that don't have to be asked in a certain way. So it's more flexible than an Alexa skill 
where EJ, you were alluding to this, how all of us had probably been frustrated if we don't ask Alexa in a certain way with a certain set of keywords, we get the standard, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get that, right? So um, in this particular case, we've engineered behind the scenes, right? So this is not a direct interaction with ChatGPT. We have an application that's interacting with OpenAI behind the scenes. And we've instructed it to be a friendly healthcare provider representative, right? It shouldn't be doing anything from a medical perspective and it should stay in that lane, right? So I'll start here. If I ask a question not related to coverage information about healthcare at all, uh, will the Chicago Bears win any games this season? Seems like a great healthcare question for your insurance company or, or healthcare provider. Yeah, I'm actually getting kind of angry asking that question, but I'm, I'm going to stay. But they won yesterday, yeah. right? They did. They won. Yeah, there um, you go. But anyway, um, I don't have the ability to predict sports events it comes back with. However, I'm here to answer any questions you have about health insurance coverage. Great. Okay. Now, what if I start with something a little bit dark? All right. I'm depressed. Okay. Related to healthcare, right? Mental health, et cetera. But again, we want to make sure this has been engineered behind the scenes to not do anything from a treatment perspective, right? So shows a little empathy, comes back and says, I'm sorry to hear that you're feeling depressed. If you need someone to talk to, if you're looking for mental health resources, I can provide information on your mental health care. Okay, great. So now let's ask a specific question. Um, is our psychotherapy... And I'm going to spell that wrong just to see if it comes back with the proper response. Sessions covered in my plan. All right. Thinks a little bit. Sometimes. There we go. So it actually took that context, blew through the misspelling of psychotherapy, and came back with specific healthcare CPT codes for psychotherapy. Now, those are public, right? Yeah. That, that is a, the LLMs know about these CPT codes. They've been trained on all that public data. But this is where it augmented that with calls to our APIs. So given those CPT codes, here are the costs associated with 30 minutes with a patient, or the cost ranges in this case, 45-minute sessions and 60-minute sessions. So this is that example of combining yeah. and augmenting an LLM with actual API calls. And, and that's a great point you bring up about like the CPT codes. You know, I don't know if anybody's done any searching around, you know, for healthcare information. Sometimes you get like a CPT code and then maybe a an abbreviated word with no vowels in it that's supposed to mean something about the uh, the the um, uh, uh, coverage that you have available to you, and then some very arcane description. And what we're seeing here, um, for those of you listening in, is you know a clear table that certainly has the CPT code because that might matter to somebody you're talking to um, or chatting with at your insurance company or, or healthcare provider. But it also has a human readable name, psychotherapy, 30 minutes with patient, a description, a 30 minutes therapy session with a patient to address mental health concerns and provide counseling or therapy, and then a cost range. Um, and you can imagine, you know, if we're looking at a cost range like here it has you know about 36 bucks through 130 uh that's that's a bit of a spread depending on you know where you are um uh, in your plan uh or your spending account um you could foresee a, a, an opportunity where if you're actually logged into your insurance provider and you have selected like you know some preferred local providers um you, you might be able to narrow that down automatically like hey it looks like you're on this plan and specifically you prefer these two providers that are within five miles of you their costs are going to be more around 50 to 60 dollars or something like that so there's a lot of opportunity to continue connecting high quality data structured or unstructured to this workflow well in ej we can get more specific than that right this is a basic high level proof of concept with dummy data we can make it specific to the individual. Maybe you've met your deductible and this is fully covered, right? That's a great. Call. Or maybe you haven't. We can say you're fully, you, or maybe a copay is required in certain scenarios, right? So 
we could evolve this to be more accurate and integrated with other bits of data. This is just a basic proof of concept that includes coverage costs and procedure costs only, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, um, and I think, well, yeah, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, one, one aspect I love of this is the comprehension that it brings to it, even though we didn't tell it to ask it if a questions. I've done yep. it once in this demo that said, hey, I went to the doctor and they said my back um, needs, needs some surgery on it. It says, well, that's sorry to hear that. Where on your back? And you give it just, I just said the middle part. The middle part, what does that mean? But it's actually gave me five different potentials that it, that it matched with just saying the middle part. So it understands, comprehends, uh, go fetches the data, gives it back to you in human readable format. It doesn't yep. have to be specific. I need exactly this thing. And, and uh, it gets the, the context of the conversation too, Ryan, right? So you can imagine like, are, are psychotherapy sessions covered in my plan? That's something that Alexa would understand if it was engineered for those kind of keywords. But in this particular case, now that we have context, I can say, what about an MRI? Well, without context, if I ask Alexa, what about an MRI? She'd probably respond with, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get that. Right. Well, it? now this understands context, right? So we know we're talking about healthcare and it comes back and actually says there are a variety of MRIs. Now, now let's even try to be a little bit less direct, right? So it's asking me what kind of MRI, right? Um, people say, I need my head scanned. Well, I think that's a true statement about you, Brownie, but, you know, I appreciate you well, sharing yeah, that with it, the listeners. You know, life influences the demos all, always, right? So now it's going to come back and now it actually gives information about a head MRI, right? So without contrast, with contrast, here are the associated cost ranges. Mm -hmm. So it's just a great example of how you can use the power of an LLM to drive a natural fluid conversation with context, right? And handle some of these basic context, uh, conversations and questions that could take load off a call center. Um, so extremely powerful. Um, and again, I, I think the, I, the idea that I wanna bring home too is th this is just a basic example, right? We did this with a couple weeks of engineering and then kind of tweaked it over another couple of weeks. Um, you're taking advantage of the power of the LLM here, which is fantastic. And you can evolve this quite a bit further beyond what we have in this proof of concept. Yeah. And I think it builds on, you know, some of the previous concepts and tenets that we've talked about in, in the previous episodes around, you know, it starts with data. It starts with understanding your data ecosystem, your technical ecosystem and, and generative AI isn't a one size fits all solution where you just throw, you know, all your data in and then magic comes out the other end. It's a, uh, it's a key tool that you use um, specifically when it makes sense, when it provides value uh, to your end user, when it provides value to your workflow. So we're talking about um, connecting uh, well-structured data or talking about connecting maybe unstructured data or poorly structured data. We, it all lives, uh, you know, out in the world. Um, and then you know, there's a little bit of workflow automation. There's a little bit of prompt engineering. There's a little bit of conversational UI. Uh, and all that works together to build a solution that allows the end user to quickly get to what they need without the frustration along the way. And for us to understand more effectively what kind of questions people are asking. People ask different questions when they're interacting with a chat bot or a, you know, a voice activated yeah. AI solution when they know they have to try and game the system a little bit. I know every time I call into a support line, I don't say the word it asked me to say. I say representative every time because I know it's yeah. probably not going to get me what, what, what I need. But if I had an experience like this where I can go from one question to answer or maybe question clarifying response answer to answer, that that's a game changer, I think, when we when we work with our clients. Certainly, as, as we saw here in the healthcare space, but um, you think about this sort of interaction with data across industry. So like super interesting stuff. Again, if you're, if you want the deep dive on, you know, kind of how we built this, some of the technical, uh, you know, in, information behind it, you know, please feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to talk about it. Um, you know, we're closing in on the end of the podcast here. I, I want to touch on a couple of quick topics. You know, maybe what are some lessons learned uh, coming out of this experience, building this POC and, and some of the other proofs of concept that we've put together um, that, uh, that that come to mind, Brownie or, or Ryan? 
Yeah, I, I can start um, with this POC. It's interesting. Developers used to interacting with APIs are trying to be as efficient as possible. Quick requests, small requests, and quick responses with a, with a very clear purpose. This is totally different. Our interactions with OpenAI in this case are extremely verbose. We have massive requests that are engineering how we want it to behave in the request um, payload. And that's usually for a developer, not the way you interact with an API. So that was a big lesson learned, just a different way of interaction uh, with an API. That's interesting. Um, I, I think the other thing is we're talking about LLMs and still their bread and butter is driving a chat or summarizing content that exists or producing net new content based on an input. Um, we were talking in our last episode about, you know, starting with the use case and a lot of the use cases we see that don't have to do with producing, summarizing net new content or driving a chat still fall into the category from a solutioning perspective of machine learning and traditional API, right? Don't try to force it. I mean, you can do some classification and ML type things with an LLM. Um, and in some cases that's fine, but don't forget this is the buzz this is this is this is what everyone's talking about right now but let's not forget about the use cases relevant for traditional machine learning right tool for the right job absolutely yep yeah i think one one piece we we didn't talk about throughout this entire conversation is fine tuning mm -hmm. nothing we've shown required fine tuning we don't Good have point. to created a brand new LLM from scratch and freeze the head and add additional content and hope for the best and rack up GPU costs. You can do a lot with just prompt engineering, keeping it in its lane, telling exactly how you want it to interact. Um, a lot of good successes we've seen. You don't even need to uh, fine tune. That's a great point, Ryan. I, I think that's and people often jump to those bigger solutions of homegrown models and uh, and and fine tuning, and really you get a lot of value out of some of the basic interactions as you step your way down the path of adoption for for generative AI in your toolbox. Well, thanks for listening in. Uh, we're going to wrap things up here. Um, again, check out the previous two episodes if you haven't. Hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, coming up on the next episode, we're going to do another demo. We're going to get into what it looks like to use generative AI for software development. Specifically, we'll talk about some of the code development tools that are out there, like uh, GitHub Copilot specifically. We'll, we'll talk about a few others. We also have some uh, thoughts and insights about how effective they are and uh, their applicability across you know senior engineers versus you know engineers that are more junior in their career and are, are starting to learn how to evaluate the outputs of tools like large language models in software development so thank you so much for listening in appreciate you both uh brownie and ryan we'll see you next time <laughs>